it, it has never been easy to be my father's son. Uh, my father was a well-known businessman in Huntsville, Alabama. He was a well-known politician. His face was on the, uh, on the front of the paper regularly. Everybody knew who John Glenn was. And because of that, everybody knew who I was, which means I got ratted out regularly uh, by people I didn't even know who knew me and who knew my dad and would call my dad and say, do you know where your kid is? Or I saw your kid. I couldn't, I couldn't get away with anything without somebody calling my dad and giving him the load. And of course, by the time they told my dad, they had embellished, you know, if I was speeding and all of a sudden I was going 120 through the neighborhood instead of uh, 65 or 70. But uh, that was tough. Uh, you know, okay, sometimes it worked for me. Sometimes knowing my dad and being my dad's son opened up doors for me because there were places that I got into that John Glenn's son could get into that regular old Mike Glenn couldn't get into, and I was certainly not uh, um, beyond um, making that work for me when it did. Uh, now we're at a different place, and my dad's been in a hospital at St. Thomas here uh, for the last 10 days or so. Uh, we rushed him from Huntsville Hospital up to an ambulance, uh, and my mom and dad chased an ambulance all the way up 65. Uh, he's doing very well, responding very well to the treatment there and uh, talking about when he'll go home sometime this uh, coming week. Uh, but it has been interesting to be his son this week. And I've uh, run up to the hospital early in the morning, so I'd be there to see the doctors and hear their report, run by here and, and take care of the details of being the pastor of Brentwood Baptist Church, run back at night and, you know, take mom dinner or something like that. And, and you know, dad is well enough now that, of course, one of the things he wants to talk about is what I'm preaching on Sunday. And so we read the passage and we began to talk about the differences between the rights of a son and the responsibilities of a son. See, I like being my dad's son when he calls me from the lake house going, when will you be here? Your mama's on her way to the grocery store. We want to make sure you, we get what you want to eat because we'll cook it and it'll be ready when you get here. There's only one thing better than having your own lake house. That's your dad having a lake house. <laughs> I love being my dad's son when I walk in and the boat's gassed up and the grill's already hot. It's another thing when he calls me and says, when are you going to be here? And he's calling me from a hospital room. Does that sound familiar? Does that feel familiar? Is maybe that one of the things that the Galatians were thinking about? That we love the rights of being children of God? We're just not so sure we want the responsibilities. We love the, 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 the right and the ability to be able to call on God anytime we want to. We are His children, He is our Father. We're just not so sure we want him calling on us. We all want the rights to be a child. We're just not sure we want the responsibilities. Maybe that's what Paul was talking about as we begin with verse 26 of chapter 3 of this letter to the churches in Galatia. Stand with me in honor of God's word. You are all sons and daughters through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed, you clothed your, yourself with, right, with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is this. That as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to the guardians and to the trustees and to the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were also in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive full rights as sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer slaves, but sons. And you're no longer, and, and since you are a son, 
God has also made you heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. But now that you know God, or rather, now that you are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're observing special days, months, seasons, years. I fear for you. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. But now that you know God, or rather, now that you're known by God, how is it that you want to go back to those weak and miserable principles? This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. You created us to be freely in love with you. And you've given us the freedom to choose every moment to grow closer to you. Don't let that freedom scare us. Let us leave this moment more free and closer to you than we were when we came in. We pray this in your name. Amen. Paul is, is extremely frustrated. He just doesn't get this. Uh, you have been offered, he tells the churches in Galatia, a free relationship. You have been set free from all of the demands uh, of any kind of, of religious tyranny. And you have been released from that. Now you want to go back. Why? You, you, are, you know God in, in your relationship with Christ. You know God in your relationship with Christ. God knows you. Why do you want to go back to those things that just don't work? Well, I don't know about the Galatians. I do know about us. And I, and I can think if, if Paul were to write that letter to us, dear brothers and sisters at Brentwood Baptist Church, you know God, and rather God knows you through Christ Jesus. How is it then you keep wanting to go back to the ways that don't help? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first one, honestly, the gospel doesn't make any sense. And we are a people that are very practical and things have to make sense. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, we know when we mess up. We know the mistakes we make. We know the, the damage that our mistakes have made. We know how we have hurt other people. We're not naive to that. Uh, we're not so numb to that that we don't understand that our stupidity has, has, has hurt people. Uh, and, 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 and we have tried to fix it. Uh, we have said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to we're blue in the face. It doesn't fix it. Uh, we have tried to put broken things back together and, and, and they break again. We can't fix this. And, and so we understand the despair of our mistakes and being trapped in the consequences of those mistakes. And then you walk into a church and there's some Baptist preacher going, listen, you're a sinner and we got that. Okay, amen, we agree, you're telling us the truth. And then the preacher goes on, but you have been forgiven. Jesus Christ paid the price that you couldn't pay on the cross at Calvary, and if you accept that price as your own, you can be free from your past mistakes. That doesn't make any sense. We know we messed up, we know we have to pay. If you do the crime in our world, you do the time. We understand that. But for somebody to say to us, Christ has died for you, you are forgiven, you get a do-over. You can start right now with a new life. He, is, he died for you, that gave you forgiveness. He was raised from the dead by God, that gives you a chance to live a new life if you just choose to take it. And from this moment on, your life can be brand new, so much so that we will begin to count history, mark time, from the time not when you were born to your parents, but when you were born again into the kingdom. This is when your life really started. In fact, 
You'll have all the rights and privileges of a child of God. You'll be able to sit right at the table of fellowship with Jesus Christ himself. And we go and we sit and we're uncomfortable. What if Jesus changes his mind? What if he says, I really don't want you sitting here anymore. What do we say? What about that little voice in our head that goes, what have you done to deserve this? What are you doing up here? What have you done to earn this? And the honest answer is nothing. We haven't done anything to deserve it. I, I'm always surprised when we're talking about somebody else, we demand that that person get justice. When we're talking about ourselves, we want mercy. Somebody else, that's justice. Ourselves, that's mercy. Can we just stop right here? Can we just call a time out in the middle of this sermon and let's just praise God that nobody gets what they deserve? Huh? Can we just say that out loud? Nobody gets what they deserve. And the fact that you're welcome into a fellowship with Jesus Christ, the first sentence is everybody at the table is in the same boat as you. Nobody deserves to be there. It's gift. It's given. And you can't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to buy it. The only thing you can do is receive it. It's gift. That makes us really uncomfortable, doesn't it? We don't know what to do with this kind of love. We would rather there be some kind of understanding about this kind of love, some kind of limit. See, I tell you all the time, a lot of us don't want a relationship with Christ. We want a contract. Uh, we want a party of the first part is obligated to treat the party of the second part this way. We want to be able to say, God, see, you signed this paper. Here's what you have to do for us. We would rather have a list of rules so we can check off because it makes us feel like we're doing something. From the very beginning of the scriptures, the, what is painfully clear is that God has created you and me to be in relationship with him. He wants us to be with him. Not meet in groups and talk about him as if he's not there. Uh, not get together and read about him as if he's not part of that conversation, but to be with him. Discipleship is not learning more information about Jesus. It's being transformed by being with Jesus. The disciple hangs around Jesus so much that the way Jesus thinks becomes the way that we think. The way Jesus speaks becomes the way that we speak. The way that Jesus does things becomes the way that we do, thing, and do, do, do things because we just see Jesus do that and we pick that up from just being around him. That being around him, that being a friend to Jesus is hard. We'd rather do something. And so when somebody shows up and goes, hey, you want to really be a Christian? You got to keep all of these rules. Well, that feels better because we can do something. So we get this big list and we start checking it off. And if you're a Baptist, it's all about church attendance. Do you come Sunday morning? Check. Do you come Sunday night? Check. Do you come Wednesday night? Check. You know, you get that little envelope. You all remember that? I'm old enough to remember you used to fill out the little envelope when you, came to, when you came to church. And you had all these little things you had to check off. Did you do these things this past week? And if you're a really, really good Christian, if you really, really love Jesus, you checked off everything. You had all your little checks. See, now, now that's okay because, see, I did something. But when you begin to think that it's up to what you do, what you're saying to Jesus, what you did on the cross isn't enough. Amen. And that's not right. That's not true at all. Jesus paid it all. And the only thing we can do is show up and be loved by him and love him back with all that we can. Why do you want to go back to these old ways? Because it's safer. It's easier. We know how to be a slave. We don't know how to live in freedom. It's, it's easier to be. You know, one of the things when you start reading through the Bible as we're doing now as a church, it, it's amazing to us how fast the children of Israel want to go back to Egypt. It's in the opening uh, uh, chapters of Exodus. They have barely gotten out of Egypt. They're on uh, the shores of the Red Sea. The Red Sea's in front of them, Pharaoh's army's bearing down on them behind them, and the first thing the children of God do is go to Moses and cry out, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to be slaughtered? 
we'd rather go back. At least we got three squares a day. We'd rather be slaves than live in the terror of this freedom. They get into the desert, cross the Red Sea. Now you would think the Red Sea being parted would be enough to convince you. You know, that would not be a kind of thing that you would forget. Somebody shouldn't have to bring that up to you. Well, you remember he parted the Red Sea. Oh yeah, I'd forgotten that. <laughs> you would think, but it's not. It gets a little hard in the desert, so they go to back to Moses. Is it not enough that you brought us out here to the desert to die of starvation? The pots were full of food back in Egypt. We just sit around and talk about all day how good it was to be a slave in Egypt. Uh, you know, I've told you before, I don't watch any TV. I, f I channel check. <laughs> Drive Jeannie crazy, but I can watch 20 or 30 shows at the same time. <laughs> and every now and then I land on one, there, there's, there's one program that's shot inside all of these prisons. And they'll talk to these prisoners. And, and every now and then they'll talk to a prisoner who was released who got out on parole, and the first thing this prisoner did was go and commit another crime, so they'd send him back to prison. Why? Oh, people outside prison, they're crazy. <laughs> Here, I know, I, you know, I got bars to protect me, I got people feed me, I know what the rules are, I'd rather be here in prison. Now you laugh. We would never do that, you say. That was what the Galatians were telling Paul. Life as a free person in Christ is just too hard. We'd rather be in prison. And it's the same thing that some of us do, isn't it? We would rather have the slavery of some human expectation than the freedom of being with Christ. Second thing. You know, the thing about a contract and being a slave is that the master can only ask so much of you. But when you're a child, the parent has the right to ask whatever they need of you, whenever they need it. And you know, honestly, sometimes it may not be convenient when the parent calls. You may have other plans, but those plans get, get, get shuttled and pushed aside because of your need to respond to your parent. We want some kind of limit of what Jesus can ask of us. If you're a son, if you're a daughter, there's no limit. So we come together and we have deep theological discussions on how should we tithe. Well, do you tithe before taxes or after taxes? We're scared to death. We're going to stand in front of Jesus, and Jesus is going to look at us and go, you tithed after taxes. <laughs> you lose all points. You were doing pretty good until you got to that tax thing, then you just blew everything. <laughs> well, Mike, uh, you know, tithing isn't mentioned much in the New Testament. No, it's not. You know why? Because the standard of giving in the New Testament is the cross of Jesus Christ. You don't stand at the foot of the cross on Calvary and negotiate percentages with the son who gave it all. How glad we are that when he kneeled in the garden of Gethsemane, he wasn't negotiating percentages with the father. He owns it all. Every breath, every heartbeat, every nickel, every dime, every talent, every resource, every car, every house, every part of your driveway, every blade of grass in your yard, it's his. You come to him and say, all of this is yours. How much do you want me to keep? All of this is yours. You see, we want a rule. Show me somewhere where it's only 10%. See, what happens if you're a successful lawyer with a growing young law firm here in Nashville and your wife has just completed her education and she started as a nurse practitioner. She's in a very fine career. Your life is set. All of your dreams and all of your plans are now in order. You're teaching a Sunday school class. You're doing everything that a nice young couple should be doing except you can't sleep at night. 
Because you know there's something else you're supposed to be doing. You know there's someplace else you're supposed to be doing it. And so David and Nicole Hannah give up their future and their life in Middle Tennessee and go to one of the most secular cities in the world, Bologna, Italy. Because David and Nicole heart breaks for those young men and young women. And we hear from him week after week and month after month, learning the language, trying to understand the culture. Week after week, nobody's responding. Coffee with hundreds of people, conversations with hundreds of people, and nobody's responding week after week, month after month. And then the Bologna Law School hears that there's an American attorney in Bologna. And David is asked to be on the faculty of the law school. We hear from him now. Praise God for the people who are in our home, who are now responding to the gospel, who are meeting in little storefronts across Bologna and across that region because David and Nicole understood that my life doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Jesus. And he has a right to tell me to go anywhere he needs me to go and do anything he tells me to do. We love having the rights of a child. We're just not sure we want the responsibilities. You see, this freedom thing is hard. And we live in a country that celebrates its freedom, but we are afraid now. We want our government to keep us safe, and we give up all kinds of rights in the name of a false security. The government now can read your email, and you not know they read it. You go to the airport, and everybody is treated like a hijacker. I'm the pastor of a Southern Baptist church. What is it about me that irritates TSA agents? <laughs> I have no idea. Is this your bag, sir? Yeah. What's in it? A Bible? <laughs> Commentaries? You know, I step over here, sir. You take your shoes off, your belt off you code off, and then you get way too friendly with somebody you don't even know. <laughs> Why? Because everybody going by me is telling that TSA agent, make sure he doesn't have a bomb. Make sure that we are safe and we trade our freedom and liberty for the illusion of security. Hear me. The only person who can take care of your security here and forever is the Jesus who died for you. Amen. There are no guarantees this side of the grave. The only guarantee is being with Christ. So we come to church and we celebrate the freedom and we give it away little bit by little bit for the illusion of being secure. But you were created to be free. You were made to be in a relationship with Christ and the, and, and the bottom, the, the first thing of that relationship, the first requirement is your choice, my choice, free will to be in that relationship. Never are you co coerced, never are you forced, never does God demand that you be in relationship to him. It's always invitation and you're free to respond and you're free to walk away. And tomorrow you respond again. Because every day you have to choose. I want to go deeper with Christ. I want to go as deep into the heart of God as I can possibly stand. And every day you have to choose. It's hard to be free, isn't it? To make a decision and then live with the consequences of, the, of those decisions. To make a choice. And then have to pay for the choice you made. We'd rather somebody else take care of us. We'd rather 
somebody else make those decisions. And so we trade away our freedom for slavery. We trade away our rights as a child because we don't want the responsibilities. You are sons and daughters of God. And the story of the prodigal son, it's interesting when the son comes back home, he tells his father, I'm no longer worthy to be a son. I want only to be a slave. Sometimes we read that and we see it is a sign of great humility. But I'm wondering if the son said, sometimes being your child is just too much pressure. Can I just be a servant? And the father refuses that. He put on him the shoes of dignity. The robe of the family. And the ring of of authority. You are my son, the father tells the prodigal, with all the rights and responsibilities of being a child. You are invited to receive this relationship with God through Jesus Christ with all the responsibilities and rights that being a child of God brings us. God has made the first move by sending Jesus. The next move is yours.